Well, happy Mother's Day. This is sure different, isn't it? Uh, I would really love to be uh, headed out to go visit my mom or to have a big brunch and gather a bunch of people around um, my, my wife, who she's not my mother, but she's my kid's mother, and she's, she's due much honor, <laughs> as many as you mothers are. This, is a, this has been a really tough time to be a mother of young people, and we get that. In fact, Heather wants to share a few words about Mother's Day right now. Hi, I'm Heather, Pastor Aaron's wife. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day this year is certainly going to look different for most of us as we are separated from our extended family. Some of you are longing to see your moms again and give them a big hug. And we'll hopefully be able to do that in the next few weeks, months, hopefully not too much longer than that. Um, others may be secretly or not so secretly glad that there's a stay at home order in place because Mother's Day brings up feelings of unmet expectations, loss, wounds, and brokenness. Some of you are grieving the loss of a child or babies that you never got to hold. Some of you are looking forward to a cheerful, loving FaceTime or Zoom get together this afternoon. One thing the last couple of months have certainly highlighted is that we were designed for relationship. And as is often the case with relationships, we are all in really different places. So today, we pray that you will be able to connect meaningfully and joyfully in relationships that are precious to you and take steps forward in healing and restoration in relationships that are challenging or have past or current wounds. We pray that you will find joy in pulling out treasured memories of your mother or children who are no longer living here on earth and that you will experience comfort. For you mothers, we pray that you will be honored, encouraged, and celebrated today. If no one else says it, we will. You are important and valued, and the sacrifices you daily make and the love and care you pour out from yourself are significant in building the lives of others. Keep going. You are making a difference, and you are seen. Your actions, wrestlings, desire to guide and teach well are honoring to God. For those of you longing to become mothers, we pray that your hearts will be comforted, that your faith will strengthen, and that somehow you will get a glimpse of God's hand and heart in this. We pray with you that next year at this time, you will be celebrating your own addition or pending addition to your family. For those of you women without children, thank you for loving, leading, encouraging, mentoring, and investing in the lives of our children and youth and their moms. And we pray that you will be encouraged today in seeing a glimpse of how you are making a difference. For each one of us, I pray that today we will reach out to at least one person and verbally pour out love, encouragement, appreciation, and care. Our words matter and are so powerful. Let's use them well today. Thank you for your continued gifts to the church. We do need them. And it's, it's a really interesting time to start forecasting how, how is this economic impact going to affect this church. And so while we were okay in April, we were able to see um, some uh, budget needs met. We still have a backlog of, of uh, budget needs that we haven't met up to and, and we're planning the future. So I uh, would just encourage you, if, if God's putting on your heart to give, please set up a recurring gift at our website. Um, Issaquah.cc slash give. We would really appreciate that. that. That's a part of our worship to God and, and certainly an area of trust for us when we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve the needs of, of God and in God's church. Um, that's a big commitment. That's a big statement. And so we get that. We understand that. That's a worshipful act for you. And we thank you for your continued gifts. We really do appreciate that. Uh, we've been able to serve our community in some brand new ways. Um, and and right now we're, we're collecting food and delivering boxes of food. We have an opportunity uh, to uh, continue to increase that. So it's pretty amazing. So thanks for those that have signed up at issaquah.cc slash care to be able to par a part of that. And, and there's more room for you uh, there as well. Um, issaquah.cc slash elder has our um, elder nomination form. So I would encourage you to jump on that. And uh, we just want you today to rest in the goodness of God. Uh, I have a friend um, who's going to help lead worship today. His name's Ron, and he's been a friend for a really long time. I used to serve with him, and he's going to lead us in worship today. And I pray that you would just be richly blessed. We're going to sing a couple songs. Um, I'm going to share a sermon from Ephesians, and then we're going to take communion together. 
and then sing another song. And uh, I just want to encourage you, uh, God is at work. So put deep roots down in this time. If you've got more time than ever, then spend that time in solitude with God. If you are more frantic than ever, let that expose the work that you need Him to do in your life. If you are finding yourself um, distracted and disturbed, turn something off, right? Turn a screen off. Turn the news off. Pitch the TV. Whatever you need to do to dig in. Because church, this is what we want. We want to come back stronger than ever as the church. When we finally do get together, and we'll make our plans to figure out how to phase all that in, but when we do get back together, we want you to come back stronger. Right now, you are commissioned to disciple your homes and your neighbors and to care for them. Right now, we need you more than ever to be out there serving and loving and caring for people. And when we get to come back, we'll come back together stronger. So let's worship together. Thanks a bunch uh, to Ron for leading us today. My name is Ron, and I used to work with Aaron Bauer uh, back at Faith Church in Kent. And a couple weeks ago, he asked me if I would uh, put together a, a little worship set for y'all, and I was happy to do so. So I look forward to the, the few moments that we get to spend together and just invite you to sing with me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every vow we could ever bring We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Jesus, the name Only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever such a strong foundation is 
because we are building upon the goodness of God. And the goodness of God permeates everything that he does and all of who he is. And because of his goodness, we can have hope. So wherever you find yourself today, whatever situation you are in the midst of, my hope for you is that you can lean this day into the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am before, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, and in darkest nights. You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Ooh, Your goodness is running after It's running after goodness is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, I'm so better now, I give you everything, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. You have been faithful All my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. So I'm here with Alex today, my 14 year old, who loves the remote control, just absolutely <laughs> loves it. And he has a hard time uh, putting it down but every once in a while I get sucked into what he's doing he's watching some antique picker garage hunter storage roadshow gatherers you know treasure hunt kind of kind of show and I'm like wow what are they finding in that garage or what are they finding in that river and he's a sucker for that and apparently I am too um, so yeah I kind of blame him for getting drawing me into those 
uh, those things. But you know, when you when there is a treasure, when there is something that uh, is really exciting, I think there's three levels of response that are going to help us today. One level is what a deal! Oh man, I got this for only twenty bucks. I'm going to sell it for twenty thousand. I'm going to be able to buy a truck, or you know, um, when I sell this, I'll have it made. That sort of thing. So there's the what a deal level. There's also what a find. Like, oh, this is a keeper. This is going to go nicely on the shelf. I, I'm excited to display that. Um, but, but when we inherit something valuable that has memories attached and future memories to be made, we say, what a treasure. What a treasure we have. So it's one thing to receive something in a will and another to have it handed to you while that person is still alive. Uh, something, oh, we could treasure this together. This could be a shared memory maker. It benefits both of us. Uh, one of the places we really like to go is to the beach house, which is uh, where my grandfather and grandmother lived. And they gave that to my parents. While they were still alive, they said, we want you to have this. I know Alex and I love going there. Uh, what's one of your favorite activities to do when we're there? Um finding crabs under the rocks. He's overturning all the rocks to look for these little teeny crabs to crawl all over and and uh, impress his friends or sisters or scare them or, or that sort of thing. Um, but we're always finding treasures on the beach. We're not really treasures, but all sorts of, of wonderful things. Hey, check this out. Hey, look at this glass. It's all smooth. Let's bring it to grandma. Those kinds of things. Um, what was the recent thing we saw? Oh, we yeah. We saw a abandoned, pi or not pirate, pirate ship, but ship. abandoned ship. Yeah, there was a, there was a uh, fishing boat that had capsized and had been spilling its contents. And so people were getting all sorts of stuff off of it. And it was just out of reach for, uh, for us to go and, yeah. and try to actually climb around on a capsized boat. But one of the neat things about this inheritance is that they, my parents are able to treasure it with their parents. And um, we've been able to treasure it with with our parents and make memories there. And so this, this little cabin on the beach overlooking the Puget Sound is amazing. And so right now the conversations are, hey, is this something that will make memories for you in the future as well? Sons, daughters, as we have our family conversations. But um, the gifts like that create relationships. And it's always been that way, a gift that binds people together and causes them to, to have a, a more deep relationship. It's the same way with God. In fact, when we speak of God's grace, we're using a term that means gift. He lavishly gives us grace. It's a, it's a gift. And it means to, to bind us together into relationship with him too. In giving us a gift, he gets the family that he wants as well. So uh, I'll say goodbye to Alex and then let me show you how this works in Ephesians chapter 1, 11 through 14, our text today. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Bye, Dad. Thanks for coming to visit. Mm -hmm. We've just been through a passage and, it, and it's really one big long sentence, so it's hard to break it up, but there's so much treasure in here that uh, we have broken it up a little bit, but uh, remember, he's lavished upon us with wisdom and insight, making known to us this mystery according to um, his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So it's in Christ that all this is happening. Then he says, in him we have obtained an inheritance. That's in Christ. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Well, that's his purpose and his work, all things according to the counsel of his will. This is, this is God ordaining all of this. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ, so the first group to hope in the Messiah, the royal messianic figure, that would be Jewish people, that would be Israel itself, hoping that the Christ would come and restore the fortunes to Israel, restore the nation. And we see that Christ is the capstone and, and he's the one who's come to complete the Jewish fulfillment. So we who are first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, praise of his glory, his significance. In him you also, now this is the other nations, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So we receive the Holy Spirit as a, as a down payment, a guarantee 
of this inheritance to come. So God is, is excited about this. This language of inheritance really means that, that he has his inheritance and we have ours. He gives us an inheritance now and he receives us as an inheritance as well. It reminds us of Israel when Israel was described as God's portion or Yahweh's inheritance. So we're as excited as we are to have his inheritance, know this. He's excited to have you as his inheritance too. It's what he deserves and what, it's what honors him. So, here we go. Um, the first thing I want you to know is that from this passage is that we are His. We are His. It was by the will of God. It's, it's what He ordained. It's what He wanted. A human family to fill the world and, and fill it with His glory. To make the world aware of His significance and His character. That He's a good and gracious, loving Creator. That's what he wants, and it's the best thing for us, too. So it's no selfish thing that he fills the world with his glory and significance, because that's how we flourish. In fact, under his management, that's how all creation flourishes. So we have this language of Yahweh's portion, or Yahweh's inheritance. Perhaps you've heard that in some psalms you've listened to or read, and you've like, oh yeah, well, his inheritance. God has a people. It's his chosen people. It's, it's his inheritance. And, and the Bible tells a story that, that God himself is among these people, and he dwells among them. A fearful thing, for sure, but, a, but what a privilege to have him in their midst. Now, the other nations didn't have this, but they did have divine beings. The scripture says all over the place um, that other nations are ruled by other gods. There's other principalities, other powers, other rulers, other uh, dark powers that are ruling over these things. So where did that all start? Well, in the fifth book of the Bible, that's Deuteronomy. It's a retelling of the law. It's, a, it's Moses revealing to the generation that came out of Egypt, the Exodus generation, what God's will is. And he warns them not to go astray. So let's look at a couple passages. Deuteronomy 4. Uh, verse 15 through 20. So we see here, watch yourselves. Since you saw no form on the day, you didn't, you didn't see God's image or God, see his, his, his uh, form at all when Yahweh spoke to you at Horeb or, or Sinai out of the midst of the fire. So don't make a carved image because that's not the kind of God he is. You could just make a carved image and then worship it. No, 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 no. And he says, you know, he says, don't, don't do that. Beware and don't, don't look to the heavens to find your gods either. For goodness sakes, that's not, that's not okay. Um, and, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bowed down to them and serve them. Things that Yahweh, your God, has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Yeah, it's. It's their job to serve these other divine beings? Yikes. Well, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven, but Yahweh has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, that's the Exodus, out of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. So as they're getting ready to go into their inheritance, and the people of God being God's inheritance, we have to realize that the other gods, little g, gods, created divine beings that have rebelled, um, are in charge of these other nations. And they are being warned, you alone are God's inheritance and he is yours. So the first thing we need to know is, is we, we are his. Um, let me just, it's not isolated, let me, let me show you Deuteronomy 29. So Deuteronomy 29, verse 26. It says this. You can, you can turn there in your Bibles. Um, be care, you know, it's another be careful thing. And, and, and the nations will say, when you get spit out of the of, when you get exiled out of this land because you worship these other gods, the people will say, it's because they abandoned the covenant of Yahweh, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went and served other gods, little g gods. Elohim, and worship them, Elohim, or little gods, whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. And so therefore the anger of Yahweh is kindled against this land. And so the curses of this book are coming on them, right? Because there was, that's not who they were allotted to. You, those other gods weren't allotted to you. You have the creator God. And this is a strange 
worldview, but it's one that we need to get our minds around because this is this is the Bible's view. Uh, here's here's another one. De- Deuteronomy thirty two seven says this um, in a psalm or a song of Moses. He says, "Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he'll show you. Your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High that's." the creator God, right? The one in charge. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So if you heard that right, the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. That's the that's the time when he divided mankind and he said, you're going to go here, you're going to go here by, by changing their language. We learned that from the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babylon, where humans decided we're going to be this, come the central focus. We'll go up and bring gods down. We'll, we'll be the ones that um, are the center and focus of worship. And God says, no, 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 that's not happening. So he divorced those people, sent them packing, put them in all these other places and allotted to them sons of God. Uh, these are, the, uh, we just read in Deuteronomy 4 and 29, these other divine beings, lesser divine beings, but that are in charge of these nations. So in case you were wondering, why do some nations of the world seem like they have this evil streak? Well, they're being, they have been ruled by that. That was Babylon's story. That was a serious story. But at the cross, Jesus is said to have disarmed the rulers and authorities, disarmed the powers. And now all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him because he gets his inheritance, which is the people of God, right? So we'll see this more in Ephesians chapter 2 as well when we talk about princes of powers and, and darkness and, and all that. But um, I just want to give you a heads up. That's, that's the story um, of Yahweh's portion of his people. Um, and, and when in the Messiah, now we are included in Israel. So first thing is we are his. Second thing is what's his is ours. So we are his and what's his is ours. In the first Exodus, they were set free to go and claim their inheritance, right? Go to the promised land. This is, this is set aside for you. Now in the Exodus, we have a family, Abraham and, and Sarah's family, now Jacob and, and his wives, and now 12 sons. So a family with 12 sons go in to um, is uh, to Egypt and out of Egypt comes Israel, a nation with 12 tribes. In the new Exodus, which we have this language in the new Exodus here of, of in him you have redemption. Um, you have his, uh, his blood has redeemed you. All this Exodus language. We've been brought out of slavery. You are not enslaved anymore. And we'll see this throughout Ephesians. You're not enslaved to like you once were. You're not in slavery. You're not in slavery. We've been brought out of slavery to obtain our inheritance. And we get the down payment of it now, it says. Um, and and the, it's not just um, Israel that gets the inheritance. Now that's expanded to true Israel. And our inheritance is expanded to include the whole cosmos. Right? Because God is uniting all things in heaven and on earth. So what's his is ours. And God intends to flood the whole cosmos, heaven and earth together with his presence and with his grace. And when that happens, the new world that results is going to be focused on Jesus. And it's going to be this inheritance that we're looking for. Now, take a second and look out the window. Uh, I'm going to do that as well. Look at if you can see any land. Um, It's okay to take your eyes off the screen for a second. Just look around you. Remember what Jesus says to his people, the little ones, the humble ones, the poor ones, you will inherit the earth. He intends to to give this to us, the whole earth. And uh, I'll tell you, the earth is longing for that as well, um, to be under new management because we have uh, ruined it so much. Um, But in Revelation, you see in chapter 21, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth brought back down and God is going to dwell among us. He's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. And we will inherit this new heaven and new earth. And it says, the one who conquers will have this heritage, this inheritance. I will be his God and he will be my son. So if you're God, if your father is the king of the universe, then you are a child and an heir, a co-heir with Christ of all that he is. So this, if, you're, if you're wondering about this destiny of ours, and you're, maybe you're a skeptic, 
when you're looking at this, it's ours to serve. <laughs> Not rule with an iron, uh, an iron boot uh, and an iron fist. It is to rule like Jesus rules, which is to give um, his life away. So that's the plan. Um, so what's, we are his and what's his is ours. But a question within this, do you think it matters to God what you do with the inheritance? Do you think it matters? In the classic movie, and I say that with tongue firmly planted in cheek, in the classic film, Bean, <laughs> Rowan Atkinson accompanies a famous painting, it's Whistler's Mother, on loan to an L.A. museum. They think he's an art critic, but he's, he's a bit more of a dunce. Um, so he's supposed to be carefully watching over this and preparing his talk about the, the loan of this artwork. And uh, while he's dusting the frame, he sneezes, and uh, and he and he goes to clean he right on the painting, and he goes to clean it off, and he pulls the handkerchief out and and wipes it, and finds there's ink on it from a pen in his pocket, so he smudges it, and he <laughs> tries to spit shine it and wipe it with a little bit of his shirt, and and uh, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. He figures out a way to get it to a workroom to, to figure this out and he's looking around and he finds lacquer thinner. That'll work and it does, it does work. It gets the paint or the ink right off and then it bubbles up and then he wipes it off and then he's left with a, an option. Come clean about all this or uh, do his own little bit. And, uh, and so he, he, he does his own artwork to, to complete the portrait. <laughs> When we think about what we've been given, this creation, on loan to us, does it matter what we do with this inheritance? Now the down payment, remember, is the Holy Spirit, and that matters what we do with that Holy Spirit, with the relationship, and, and that, that absolutely matters. But with this creation, have you thought about that? Do we just say, um, well, you know, it doesn't matter if we mess with the artwork, you know, we've got this this uh, this painting on loan, and it doesn't matter what we do with it because the the painter, original painter, can come back and just clean it up anytime he wants. So let's just use it as a dartboard or something like that because it doesn't matter after all. No, 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 no. It matters what we do here and now because we are inheritors, because we are heirs of this new creation. It matters terribly much. I love what Lynn Kohick says. She's a commentator on Ephesians. She says, God's redemptive work establishing the church as a beachhead in the present age, so it's, it's beginning, right? This new creation movement is beginning, it means that believers should engage in bringing God's mercy, justice, and grace to our communities at all levels, schools, hospitals, governments, as a real, natural, and expected part of the church's conviction that Christ is now Lord of all, not just of believers' hearts, that he is Lord of, of all. And so we are now caretakers of this. I'm really encouraged by our um, group and our care coordinator, Angela, has been working to provide these meals. Um, we've gone from four meal deliveries this last week to now this week, 35 more, <laughs> starting tomorrow when the, when the team gets together. So, um, you know, the little things like that and the way we've been caring for homeless people, the way we care around the world with our missions work, I mean, it really does matter. And how we care for the planet absolutely matters. Now, what your little work does here, um, how that translates to new creation remains to be seen because God's going to make all things new. But it certainly matters how we think about the inheritance we have now. So we are his and what's his is ours by the Spirit. Remember, this is the down payment of the Spirit. We're, we're not just waiting to get our inheritance. We get the down payment now. We have a taste of home now, a taste of new creation now. The guarantee, the down payment is the Spirit of God who dwells among us and in us. Now think about this. Israel had the presence of God among them, right? And now the nations can experience His presence in Christ through His Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is to the Christian and the church what the cloud and the fire were in the wilderness. Now think about this, more Exodus language, but remember the cloud uh, by day and the pillar of fire by night, God's very presence among them, the powerful, personal presence of the living God, holy, 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 and not to be taken lightly. He was leading and guiding this often confused and rebellious people to their inheritance. And now the Spirit is doing that same thing to us. 
remind yourself. Let me remind you. It really matters how you respond to the Spirit's work in your life. Uh, And what a mystery it is that God wants all people, not just the chosen people. Uh, And think about it. It's the Gentiles to whom this letter is specifically addressed, saying, you have a share in God's heritage. It's full and, and f- as full and firm as any of your Jewish brothers and sisters. It's, it's, a, it's a full, complete picture, and it's in the Spirit. One thing I've, I've just encouraged people to do, and, and I want to encourage you to do, is just ask the Holy Spirit right now, how's my relationship with you? Am I grieving you? Am I pushing you off? Or am I being responsive to your leadership? When, when the cloud of, uh, by day and the fire by night lifted up and moved, the people went. Are we being that kind of responsive people? If we are, uh, then we are going to enjoy his powerful presence in, in more ways than we could imagine. So please, God, bring that. So we are his. What's his is ours by his spirit for his glory, right? Paul writes that, that God has destined us to be his children to the praise of his glorious grace. And then he's made us his heritage and appointed us to live for the praise of his glory. And that one day he'll redeem his people who are his possession to the praise of his glory. The significance of God should be manifested in the people of God. This is is the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Do you remember that? I'm going to have Emily share that with you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. (laughs) Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is a a rhythm that we must be in and we must stay in. I remember we're training to reign with him. And so our decision making should be influenced by this. So I want you to think about this. What would hallow the name? Hallowed be the name. What does that mean? Well, it means that to make it more treasured and more loved in the world. So will this next decision I'm about to make bring more honor and glory to to the Father? Will it show his significance? Or is this about boosting my brand, boosting my ego, boosting my name? So hallowed be thy name. When we pray that way, we are committing ourselves to living our lives in such a way that makes his name great. So our decision making should be what will hallow his name? What will complete his rule in us, make his kingdom come more? Is this next decision with your job opportunity or, or your opportunity to serve or care or preach or talk to the people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, will this complete his rule in us? And will it accomplish his will on earth as in heaven? See, as as inheritors now, we get to participate in what will be our inheritance. In some ways, when I go to help out my dad at the beach house, I'm helping out myself a little bit. If if this inheritance passes to the children, I'll I'll be able to participate in some of those different things. So there's there's a joint nature in this inheritance that we are to receive, and it should make a difference in how we participate with God now. This is not a waiting game. This is a full involvement game, and our lives should be about this decision. God, may your name be more reverenced and loved. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done. That is our prayer as a church in the decisions we're making, and and we're asking God to to work within the the limitations that he has of, of us as people to bring about his glory in the land. I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, without you, I fall apart, 
You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need thee. We come to the table, come to communion with that same mindset that says, oh, we're desperate for what you provide for us. We alone are not okay. We can't figure this out on our own. We can't have God's holy presence living with us when we are blemished, when we are rebellious. So come and, and heal us. Come and purify us. So that's what we do with the bread and the cup. Every week we, we, we talk about our communion together um, and our communion with God as his people. We are his, right? And what's his is ours by the Spirit for his glory. I have with me some grape juice and a little tortilla piece, um, but let me pray for, for the elements you've, you've gathered as well. Father, you are so gracious and good to us. Would you continue to fill us with this story that we're in? a story of great consequence and great inheritance. Thank you that you've purified a people with your blood. Thank you that you've sacrificed yourself, that sin has been dealt with on the cross, that you've disarmed the powers that would seek to draw us down, and that we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. We need you more than ever right now. Amen. So as we take um, the bread, we're reminded that this is, this is his body broken for us. Eat this in remembrance of him. And Jesus passed around the cup you know, on that night that he was betrayed, and he said, this is the covenant, a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
It's an amazing thing to be the church. It's quite a heritage, all that we have in him and all that he wants to do through us. When peace like a river attended my way When sorrows like sea bills pleasure it's been to worship with you. Thanks for letting us into your home. May God richly bless you until we meet again.